Well, I have the sense that some of what I'm going to share this morning, some of you will find just extraordinarily encouraging and uplifting, and some others may find it very difficult. Um, maybe some will find both. <laughs> um, but I believe that there is a foundational message throughout all of Scripture from um, Bereshit, Bara, Elohim, all the way through the coming of New Jerusalem down and God dwelling with us from the very first words to the very last. And the message is this. Generosity produces abundance. Selfishness produces poverty. This is there in a thousand ways. And sometimes we're not even aware that this is what is being revealed to us. And sometimes God places some little hints and surprises along the way to lead us to understand his graciousness, his grace. And so I'm going to start by giving a picture of what some of those little hints look like. And then I'm going to take us through the Akedah. This is Genesis 22. If you want to open your Bible there, we're going to go through it and you will see, I promise, things that most of you have never seen in this passage of scripture. If you have, God bless you. But I suspect for many, some of this will be new understanding. There is a form of poetry uh, common to scientists. All of the poems begin this way. Here lies John Doe. You know that it's going to be one of those poems when you hear those words. Here lies John Doe. Thoroughly transfixed with his thumb on pin three of a live 6L6. A 6L6 is a vacuum tube, and pin three is high voltage. And so that's a science joke, or an electronics joke. Um, ha ha. <laughs> Here lies John Doe with us no more, for what he thought was H2O, was H2SO4. That's sulfuric acid. Okay? Science joke, science poem pattern. Music, much of the music that we hear in modern days has similar patterns. Here from the Beatles. I pretend that I'm kissing the lips I am missing and hope that my dreams will come true. And then while I'm away, I'll write home every day and I'll send all my loving to you. Now there's a structure there and it goes A, A, B, C, C, B. That's the poetic structure. I'll pretend that I'm kissing A, the lips I am missing A. So there's a rhyme, two lines parallel and they rhyme at the end. And I hope that my dreams will come true. That's a C, hang on to it. Or that's a B, rather, hang on to it. And then two lines stuffed right after it. And then while I'm away, I'll write home every day, that rhyme. And then the final line, and I'll send all my loving to you. That rhymes with the will come true. That was three lines up from there. And much music is written in this way. That's how when we open the book of Psalms, we know that these are songs. It's because they have a certain structure, a poetic structure. We also know that they were sung because many of them right at the very beginning have an instruction. It'll say something like, of David for the choir master, or of David to the tune of 
the lilies. So you know there was some song that they knew really well called the lilies. And this new song, this new poem, is to be sung to that tune that everybody knows. Or of the sons of Korah for stringed instruments. Again, you know that it's going to be a song. Well, it turns out that not only are there structures in scripture that sort of define poetry. You'll see that even in some places in the New Testament where it's evident that Paul or someone is quoting a song that everybody knew and sang. And when you see it in the text, instead of being run out like regular sentences, it'll break and then it'll be set up like reading a poem. And they're not sure exactly who wrote that song, what other verses there might be, but they know that the writer is quoting something that everybody sang together. Abraham, the father of us all, the one who lived before there were Jews, or Gentiles for that matter, the progenitor, the father of us all. What do we know about Abraham? We know that God spoke to him directly and asked him for things. And Abraham's response universally was, yes, Lord. Yes, yes. And not just in some sort of cheap way, but abundantly, generously. Every encounter you see with Abraham, his response is generous. And God promises him abundance. His seed will multiply. All nations will be blessed through him. Because of his obedience, but because of his generosity as well. If you read about the sacrifices that God calls upon in the tabernacle or the temple, they all look something like this. I want the firstborn of the flock. I want the first harvest of the grain. It must be unblemished. Without wound or sore, pure. Now in one way we can interpret this as God who is pureness wants nothing brought to him that isn't pure. And that's not wrong. But he's also asking for the very best that those who bring a sacrifice to him have. He's not asking for leftovers. He's not saying after you've thoroughly enjoyed everything you have and you've got scraps left on the table, don't give all of them to the dogs, bring some of them to me. No, he's, he's not doing that. And the truth is a lot of us think about what we give to God financially in some ways, but let's just say with our lives, with what we have left over from all of the things that we want to do for us. The song we sang, all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. The elders are wearing crowns because they have been given power and authority. And those crowns worth the empires over which they reign are the most valuable things they own. And so they don't give God the dirty socks or the worn out sandals or the old 
garments in tatters. They give their crowns before the Lamb of God. And look at what God gives us. His only begotten Son. What does he have that's more valuable than that? And he gives us that. He calls on us again and again and again. Give generously. Generously your best. He wants your best. He wants that kind of generous heart where you don't hold back. You give. Genesis 22, the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. This passage, by the way, among the Jews is considered the essence of the entire Old Testament, of the Torah, of the whole Tanakh, of everything. This one chapter, Genesis 22. Everything about God is considered to be included in this one chapter of Genesis. It's similar to in Asia, there is a thing called the little gospel. The little gospel means John 3.16. Effectively, the whole gospel is contained in that one sentence. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him does not die, but lives forever. He gives his very best in that little gospel. It's all contained there, the heart of God, our response. It's all in that one sentence, the little gospel. Well, Genesis 22 if you would, is the Jewish version of the little gospel. It's regarded as containing all of the important things that we can know about God. And there's some surprises here. Here's how it starts. Now, it was after these things that God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham... Hineni, that's the Hebrew word. Hineni, he said. This is a really interesting word in Hebrew. It means a lot of different things. It's used in a lot of different ways. The same basic word. The only equivalent I can think of it in English is hey. So it would be like this. I'm I'm calling attendance. Chung, hey. Jim, hey, right? It's like one way it is. I'm here. Here, look here, right? But hey can also be used when you see the porch pirate stealing the book you just ordered, and you go, hey! (laughs) And he stops and drops it and runs away. It can also be you see something absolutely beautiful, and you go, hey. And then you share that beautiful thing that you see. Or somebody says something and you're not quite sure, hey? Or imagine two people who really love each other and they're sort of cuddled down for the night. And one says to the other, hey. And the next second one says, hey. And they fall asleep. So this sound Hineni in Hebrew is that kind of word. It's used to sort of call attention to all of those different kinds of things. It's throughout this passage, but it's almost never translated the same each time. And so in English, we miss it. You're reading this in Hebrew, you're going, oh, oh. Oh, so God said to Abraham, Abraham, he said, 
Then he said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains about which I will tell you. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men, basically workers, with him, and Isaac, his son. He split wood for the burnt offering and got up and went to the place about which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to the young men, sit yourselves down here with the donkey. As for me and the young man, that is Isaac, we'll go over there, worship, and return to you. Then Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on Isaac, his son. Now, Christians typically look at this and they go, wait, there, there's a picture here that's important. Here's the only son who he loves and here's wood on his back. He took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on Isaac, his son. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on forever. Hold on to that phrase. The two of them walked on, sorry, together. Then Isaac said to Abraham, his father, my father? Then he said, well, the English is, here I am, my son. The Hebrew is, Hineni. Pay attention. <laughs> Hineni. And Isaac said, Hineni. Here's the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now, it's here that I want to pause and tell you that those of us who heard this story in Sunday school, or you've seen it in a children's Bible book, or maybe you saw a little felt thing on a board. I don't know if they even do those anymore. The picture always is of Abraham, this big, strong man, and Isaac, probably eight or nine, a young boy with this wood on his back. The very best scholarship says Isaac was probably 35 when this happened, which means Abraham was 135. Who's the big strong one in this picture? And Isaac is no dummy. You'll see this here and throughout the rest of scripture with Isaac, he's, no, he's figured it out, is the short version. When he says, my father, we have the wood and the fire. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? He's figured it out. And his father doesn't say, you're it. sort of eh, doesn't really respond fully. And he says, God will provide to himself a lamb for a burnt offering, my son. The two of them walked on together. Remember I said, hold on to this sentence. The two of them walked on together. Now just two sentences later, the same one again. The two of them walked on together. Like Hineni, this is a structure 
intended to draw your attention to the most important thing happening here. It's right in the dead center of the entire chapter. And it's framed right in the dead center by, and the two walked on together. And what happens dead center is Isaac asks his father, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? The two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place about which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there, laid out the wood, bound up Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Really? The old man? 135? overpowers the 35-year-old? Well, I don't think he could overpower a nine-year-old who didn't want to be there. But at 35, this is even more obvious. But it just goes on. And laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But an angel of Adonai called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, Hineni. Then he said, do not reach out your hand against the young man. Do nothing to him at all. For now I know that you are one who fears God. You did not withhold your son, your only son, from me. God has just acknowledged the generosity of Abraham's heart, his willingness to give the very best that he has to the one who made him. And God sees that and acknowledges it. But just put a pause there. We're going to come back. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and behold, actually, then Abraham lifted up his eyes and Hineni. There was a ram just caught in the thick of the bushes by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham named that place Adonai Yireh, as it is said today on the mountain Adonai will provide. Then the angel of Adonai called to Abraham a second time from heaven. I'm going to just pause and we'll come right back here to the ending. There is an ancient Jewish commentary on this passage. And it's this. That at the moment Abraham raises his hand with the knife in it, two angels are looking down from heaven. And the one says to the other, look at this remarkable thing going on down on earth. The man raises up his knife to slay his only son. And the son stretches forth his neck to be slain. You want a picture of what happened at the cross? That's it. Yeah, the wood on the back, sure. The sun stretches forth his neck to be slain. He knew. He knew when he asked the question. And the two walked on together. And he didn't fight his father 
to be placed on that altar. He cooperated because he knew. Verse 15, the angel of Adonai called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I swear it is a declaration of Adonai. Because you have done this thing and did not withhold your son, your only son, I will richly bless you and bountifully multiply your seed like the stars of heaven and like the sand that is the seashore, and your seed will possess the gate of his enemies. In your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed because you obeyed my voice. Generosity produces abundance. Selfishness produces poverty. Then Abraham returned to his young men, and they got up and went together to Beersheba. Then Abraham dwelled in Beersheba. Now it was after these things that it was told to Abraham, look, Hineni, Hineni, verse 20, Hineni, Milcha also has borne sons to Nahor, your brother. Uz is firstborn, Booz his brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Hesed, Hazo, Pildash, Yidlaf, and Bethuel. Then Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight, Milchah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Reumah, also bore to Ba, Gaham, Tahash, and Maka. Abundance, more abundance. Abundance to his whole family. Abundance upon abundance. Because he gave his best. Just as God gave his best to us. What he teaches us is what he taught Abraham. This is the pattern. You give generously of your encouragement of others who are struggling, of your time to those who need care, of your money to build up the kingdom of God, of your prayers for those who need prayer. You give your best and your best and your best. And what God shows by his own example and by his example of Abraham, the response of heaven the response of the universe is abundant blessing because we didn't withhold. When Jesus criticized the Pharisees for tithing their herbs, it was because they withheld their best from the poor and the widowed and the needy and those in jail. And with that selfish spirit, what did they create? Poverty all around them. Spiritual poverty. Fiscal poverty. Life poverty. Jesus demonstrated and taught. Give. Generously. Over and over and over. Don't. Hold back. Don't give second best. Don't give the leftovers. Firstborn, pure, spotless, the best that you've got. Because he blesses that. And uses you, uses me to bless the world and bring it to genuinely abundant life. May we all be Abrahams in our hearts and in our lives.